Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimble Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. A quick update for our faithful listeners and fans. We recently asked you to help us in our bid to secure our nomination in the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Well, thanks to you, we're a finalist in the Best Technology Podcast category, along with other noteworthy shows like Recode Decode and The Vergecast. The awards ceremony will be streamed live on September 30th, which turns out to be International Podcast Day. Keep your fingers crossed for us and a huge thanks to everyone who voted. You have our utmost gratitude. Today, we're joined by E. Zhu, a PhD candidate at UC Merced focused on geospatial image analysis. In our conversation, E and I discussed his recent paper, What Is It Like Down There? Generating dense ground level views and image features from overhead imagery using conditional generative adversarial networks. E and I discussed the goals of this research, which is to train effective land use classifiers on proximate or ground level images, and how he uses conditional GANs along with images sourced from social media to generate artificial ground level images for this task. We also explore future research directions, such as the use of reversible generative networks, as proposed in the recently released OpenAI Glow paper, to produce higher resolution images. Enjoy. All right, everyone, I am on the line with E. Zhu. E is a PhD candidate at UC Merced. E, welcome to This Week in Machine Learning and AI. Uh, hi, Sam. Hi, everybody. So thank you for having me. It's really excited to be here. Absolutely. I'm really looking forward to digging into your work today. To get us started, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got started in machine learning? So actually, my major at first is wireless communication because my undergraduate study was on like signal processing and information theory. But then at the year of 2012, when deep learning first showed its great potential on ImageNet Challenge, so I was fascinated by its simplicity and the surprisingly good results. So I started to attend some like Kygo challenges using deep learning, uh, including the famous dog and cat classification challenge. So although at that time, most of the challenge winners are still using random forest or XG boost, um, but later I found myself like attractive to this machine learning field and especially deep learning. So I'm thinking, so why not change a major? So in my understanding, so in- images are still signals captured by optical sensors. So they are not that different from my previous study. So I switched my major to computer vision and start my PhD study at UC Merced in 2014. So basically, I have two lines of research directions right now. One is geospatial image analysis. The other is a video analysis. But I think today I will just focus first on one. You mentioned that you started uh, competing in Kaggle competitions. What were some of the competitions that you competed in? So the first one will be the dog and cat challenge. So that's a, that's an object det- uh, uh, like a recognition problem, like a binary thing. And later, I also competing the challenge of the so the eye contact of the dri- driver to to try to understand uh, if the driver is sleepless or is it a safe driver or something. So that's also a, a so, like an autonomous driving challenge. Okay. And uh, and then also for the insurance to see a car's image. And so whether it is like a damage or not, is it a new car? So do so how much price should they uh, sell for a second-hand car? So that's uh, for the insurance company. So there are several more, but I cannot remember the details. Yeah. Okay, awesome. I don't know the last two, the driver eye contact or the insurance one, but the dog and cat one is one that we have gone through. I'm, I'm working with a group of folks to kind of go through the fast AI course, and yeah. they talk about that dog and cats one in there quite extensively. How did you do in the Kaggle challenges you, you did? So firstly, I just uh, try so like a linear regression. So that's the most basic model. Like I think m- most people still use it today for like normal questions. And then I also try like a random forest and XG boost. So at that time, so most winners are using those two techniques and uh, uh, and then in- model ensembling to get to the best score they can. 
Um, but then I also try like deep learning, right? So convolutional neural networks for this image recognition task. And at first, they cannot compete with like a random forest because the images are not that large. So, you know, like a deep learning is a data hungry model, right? So if you have more data and if you have like a clean data, so you can get a very good result. But if you don't have enough data, so you, maybe sometimes it doesn't compete with those traditional algorithms. Yes, yeah, that's basically the four algorithms I'm using for Kaggle challenges. How did you rank in the competitions? Did you rank highly in any of them? Um, I didn't rank like a top one or top 10 something, but I'm usually in the top 10%. So. Okay, nice. And so your research now is on uh, understanding images using deep learning, and you recently published a paper. The paper is called, What is it like down there? Generating dense ground level views and image features from overhead imagery using conditional GANs. That There's a ton in there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the title is quite long. <laughs> <laughs> the title is quite long. Um, I mean, maybe let's get started. I think, you know, we've talked about GANs quite a bit on the podcast, but why don't you start us out by talking about conditional GANs? Okay, yeah. So yeah, uh, I have seen those like a GANs episode uh, here and there. So it's very hot topic like last year and the trend is still going on. Um, so so as we know, so GAN consists of two components, so one generator, one discriminator. Um, but the thing is, when you generate something, so you are generating from a random noise. So each time you will get different results, different output. Um, but sometimes you really want to have some like fixed output, right? So uh, that is what conditional GAN for. Um, for like for example, sometimes a like a fashion like a shoe designer. Uh, they want to design uh, using a GAN to design a new shoe. But um, if you didn't control the output, sometimes it will begin something really random. Uh, so if we can give the model some information, like prior information, like uh, some texture embeddings, like uh, I want a shoe. So then the output will definitely be a shoe image. So that's what GAN for. Uh, so C GAN, so the conditional GAN, learn the distribution condition on some auxiliary information. So those auxiliary information um, can be class labels, or which is the most standard form, uh, or text embeddings for generating images, or like image-to-image -image translation. Um, so here in our work, so we use conditional GAN because uh, we know what we want, right? We want ground-level images corresponding to the like overhead image. So given me an uh, overhead image, uh, I want to generate a similar looking ground level images. So the overhead image will be considered as a prior information. Yeah, so that's why we choose like conditional GAN. And what you're going for kind of visually is if you send in to the system the image of, you know, what an area that looks like farmland, you want yep. to generate ground level pictures that look like farmland. Similarly, if you're sending in overhead images of an urban setting, you want it to generate urban images. Yes, exactly. Tell us about the different data sources that you use to make all this happen. Okay. So the ground level images, the problem there is they're sparse. So um, what we can have is uh, satellite images, right? Satellite images is dense, so in everywhere. So it has um, all the uh, satellite images at every spatial location. So that is the, our like, Im uh, image input source. So the ground truth and cover map uh, is from the LCM uh, dataset. So our, our study region is a seven, 71 by 71 kilometer region containing like in London. Um, so the so geographic images are labeled as urban or rural based. So then we can do a very simple like a binary classification problems. Um, so our input sources are like a, uh, a lot. So from like a Google Maps statistics and a geograph API and also the uh, satellite images. So those are the three image sources we're using. The LCM data set, is that your overhead images or are those your ground images? Uh, th those are the overhead images. Okay. And the ground level images is from the ge uh, Geograph. Geograph the, that is a website um, by some London researchers. So those are for the whole United Kingdom. So the land 
our classes are provided on a one kilometer grid. So for every grid, they have the user provided ground level images. So, so that's pretty accurate. So that is our ground level images. And the LCM is the overhead images. So we have the corresponding relationship to train our models or do, do some experiments. Uh, And so I realized that what you're doing here with GANs is fundamentally generative, but part of the the way the problem is set up sounds like an information retrieval problem, like you have this overhead image and you have this corpus of ground level images kind of find the best one. Are those related in any way? Oh, so there there is difference there. So for like an image retrieval problem is, so given me overhead images, I want to find the best matching like ground level images right so there is like a there's a database of the ground level images so we try to find the like most matching one so but for generate models it's not where we want some specific image so we don't want some specific ground level images to corresponding to the overhead image we want the whole data distribution to fit so the we want the generator to generate some real looking images to fit the data distribution so we don't care about so which images we're generating we just want it to look realistic for that category so that's the only difference and do you do any kind of information retrieval as part of the solution? In other words, is your GAN conditioned only on the overhead image or is it conditioned on the subset of images that you retrieve from a database based on the overhead image? Uh, that's a good question. So actually, uh, right now, we only like, like uh, based our model on GAN. So, so we're, not, we're not using any information retrieval thing. Okay. So, but uh, in the future, we want to use that because um, the land use classification problem is a really challenging. It's really, really hard. So m- maybe later I will introduce my another work. So it's, a, it's also about large scale land use classification, but the classification accuracy is only like a 20%, 30%. So it's pretty challenging. So we need to have some um, like a human prior knowledge inside it. So like the information retrieval, info, like side information you mentioned about. So we, we will do that in the future work. So in this work, what are some of the big challenges that you had to overcome in uh, in this paper, in this research? Okay, so uh, can I like uh, back up a little bit to talk about the motivation of this work? So, so that oh, the readers please. will be m- more clear. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, so the motivation to like all of our work is because although we have like enormous amounts of online images, like from Flickr, Instagram, so all those images, all those videos, we could use it to do some geospatial analysis. But uh, if we want to do a detailed land use classification map, so land use, I mean, is for example, so whether a building is a hospital or whether it's a shopping mall or something. So, so how do we use the land? So whether it's residential or for office use. So, but overhead images cannot handle such case because overhead images is from like above, right? So from above, you can only see a building. So you cannot see inside of the building. So you don't know what's that designed for. So that's what we come up with. So we want to use social multimedia to do this kind of like a land use classification because social media is captured by phones or by cameras. So they can see inside the building to easily infer what it is of this building. So where it is. But the, the challenge, the most big challenge uh, of using social media is its uneven spatial distribution. Right? So simply speaking, because most images are coming from the famous landmarks, right? so not the general spatial locations. Like there are tons of people having the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, like Eiffel Tower in Paris. So it's very easy to tell these landmarks from the photographs. But for like residential areas or privacy pre- preserved regions, so we don't have enough images. So that's a very serious problem. So if we don't have images, so how can we infer the location and all those land use classification information? So that's the challenge we really face about. So traditional, there are several ways to do that. So one simple way is to interpolate the features. Right? So if we have For example, we have several images at location A, and we have several uh, images at another location B, and these two locations are close to each other. But between these two locations, there is no images at all. So in this case, we just compute the image features of these all the images at those two locations and interpolate them along this line. 
but uh, but here we made assumption that the assumption is we hope the image features will change smoothly in the spatial domain. But actually, in most cases, it's not the case, right? So if we have several images of um, like a residential and uh, at location A and a residential and location B, then if you do the like interpolation thing, so it will interpolate. So between these two locations, all the areas are residential based. But actually, in most cases, then the, the, the space in between is like a forest or park or just a river or something. So it's like nat natural things. So the other kind of method is, so we try to use other information like remote sensing images or Google Street Wheels because those two information sources are like dense, so everywhere in the, on the Earth. Uh, so there is a work from like Professor Nathan Jacobs' lab and uh, in ICCV 2017. So they just use Google Street Wheels to do this kind of things. But we find that so all those techniques um, are based on image features are, and are based on the assumption I just said. So the image features change smoothly in the spatial domain, but usually that's not the case. So that's why we do this work. So if we cannot use the image features, why not we just use images? But uh, the images are missing at those locations. So how do we come up with new images? So fortunately, we have GANs. Yeah, so that's the motivation of the work. You mentioned that early in your research career, you spent some time looking at information theory and the like. And it strikes me in that context that this is a pretty difficult problem and that there's just not enough information in these satellite images to do a very good job coming up with ground level images. How do you get around that? Yeah. So... So both like uh, overhead images and ground level images has this like advantages and drawbacks. So as I said, so the uh, overhead images is very accurate and it is dense in everywhere. So we can totally use this kind of information. But uh, if you want to see inside a building, so overhead images cannot do that. But ground level images, we can see inside a building, but the biggest problem is the uneven distribution. So from the in, like information theory side of in, uh, like point of view, so we should use both information sources um, to how to combine them in the best way to get the best result. Yeah, this is a good point. Yeah, maybe to, maybe to make my question more concrete, it, it has to do with what you considered your error function to be or, or something along those lines. I, and I guess the, the thing that I am trying to articulate here that strikes me as being particularly interesting and challenging here is with a ground level image, you know, beyond just trying to generate like high, you know, whether a particular image looks kind of urban or looks like, you know, greenery or forest or things like that. Uh -huh. You know, there are things that you're trying to generate that aren't at all represented in your uh, in your input. So, for example, your satellite image, you know, has no building facades. But if you're trying to generate imagery around an urban area, those ground level images will have building facades. So it's just kind of making that stuff up. And I'm wondering, does that uh, fact play into kind of how you build out the model and what the loss function is and stuff like that? Does that make any oh, sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Um, so, but actually, our work is in the very like initial stage. So currently, we're just using a very traditional conditional GAN to do that, and the loss function is just like generating realistic looking images. So we're not considering like um, whether there is a discrepancy uh, like between the ground level images or overhead images or any other like uh, objective function. We're just using conditional GAN without other stuff. So the the loss function only thinking about realism versus not realism is that kind of axiomatic for conditional GANs? Yes, it is. So okay. for yeah, for most of the conditional GANs, it's just uh, so for the discriminator, its job is just to say so whether this image is fake or real. So it's a binary problem, and the objective function is it's just that. So entropy loss. Okay, got it. So you you built this GAN based system to produce these images. Um, we were just talking about loss functions. Like, what did you find in terms of its performance? How did the system do? Yeah. So uh, in terms of the image quality, so I, I don't like have a monitor to show the quality here, but uh, um, basically it makes sense. So uh, we can generate like 
uh, some realistic images, like uh, ground level images, according to the overhead images. And uh, but we don't have like a like a evaluation metric, so how real they are or how accurate they are. So uh, we use another task. So that's a land use classification, right? Because um, if we can do a better land use classification given these like a fake images, so, so we can create fake images all over the ground, right? So if we can use these images to like do better land use classification, so that of accuracy can be a good indicator of how our m model works. So let me like share the performance of our land use classification problem. So if you if we are using the conditional GAN generated features to do the land use classification, we can achieve like a land color uh, land cover classification accuracy with like 73% accuracy. So actually, it's kind of like um, uh, it's reasonable. It's not high, but it's reasonable. The problems we're thinking here is because the generated our generated images are not realistic enough. So that's some of our future work. So we have like a three future directions to go. So I, I can talk about it later, like if you like want. Uh, in the land use classification, how many classes are there? Uh, it's it's only binary classification. So like as I mentioned, it's a rural and uh, urban areas. So because that's uh, that's only the like, ground truth we have. Okay, so you've got a bunch of satellite data. You feed it into your conditional GAN. Uh, it generates an image that uh, is meant to be representative of a ground-level view of the area that you indicate. Mm -hmm. um, and then you are sending that into a classifier uh, that is meant to determine whether it's urban or rural. And the is the seventy three percent is that the accuracy of your classifier or the accuracy of the generator based on a train classifier? Oh, it's a it's a the classifier. It's the, the classifier. Land use. Okay, the classifier itself. That's what I thought you were saying. And so, uh -huh. you know, how did the 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 GAN itself perform relative to with that classifier? Okay, so the baseline of that is, so uh, we compare to like a traditional approaches, right? So the first approaches I'm talking about is interpolated features. So if we have some images, we just do the feature extraction first and interpolate the features uh, on those regions without images. So the baseline is like 65%, okay, so 65. So if we're using GANs without conditional, like we're getting like a like a two or three percent improvement, like to the almost the sixty eight percent. And if we're using conditional again, we're having like seventy percent. And if we're using conditional again generated features, we're ha having the best accuracy, like seventy three percent. So that's the progress of our work. And and I just want to make sure I understand this. I thought what you were saying was that the the classifier itself, like totally separate from the GAN part of the system, had a seventy three percent accuracy. Did you model the the land use classifier separately, and that was seventy three percent? Yes. So the land uh, so the land use classifier is totally separate from the GAN, right? So right. the GAN the GAN is about generator discriminator. The job is to uh, like create really create these images. images. Yeah. Yes. And, and then we, we use the features from the discriminator as the input to the land use classifier. Okay. Right. I guess what strikes me as odd is that, or at least curious, is that if I understood you correctly, your ultimate accuracy of your GAN turned out to be exactly the same as the accuracy of your classifier, 73%. Um, maybe I'm saying wrong. So because for GAN, there's no like accuracy, right? So GAN for the discriminator is just a uh, real or fake. So we don't care about that accuracy or not. Um, so it's usually very high. So like uh, like 80% or 90% is very, very high. But uh, what we are uh, care about is the land use classifier. Yeah. So what I'm saying, all, the accuracy is all for land use classifier. It's not for GAN classifier. Okay, I think I'm confusing the the issue here and and not okay. doing a good job explaining. So, I guess I'm thinking that there are as we we established there are two separate systems. There's yes. the the generating system 
-hmm. Its input is an overhead image and its output is a ground level image. And there's a classifying system and its input is a ground level image and its output is a land use classif a binary land use classification. Yes. And so the performance of the, the, the GAN is a subset of that first system and it's responsible for generating these images and it's kind of judged on whether the images are realistic or not. But that whole first system, the generator system as a whole, right, you're giving it a satellite image and it's spitting out a ground level image. We can measure that its accuracy with respect to producing kind of the correct uh, land use, right? Right. Yes. So that that's one kind of accuracy measure. And then there's another, which is given any kind of image, whether it's generated from our gener generator or not, you know, is this land use classifier model accurate in classifying the input image correctly. And then there's like a third performance metric, which is the end-to-end, -end, right? Given a satellite image, can we identify the, yen the land use correctly? And so which of these is the 73%? Uh, it's the second one. So for the third one, we're not doing end-to-end -end right now. So oh, okay. we're just, we're doing two stage. So first stage is GAN, the second stage is land use. We're not doing end-to-end -end at this point. Yeah, I guess if you're not doing end to end, you're not really looking at the first, uh, the performance of the generator either, because that yes. really is the end to end. Uh huh. Okay, got it. Is the main focus of the research around modeling and ca testing this the classifier then, or is it the generator system? Uh, the classifier, right? Because we're um, so for geospatial analysis, we're more caring about the land use system. So basically, it's a zoning system, right? So usually the government and city will make a zoning map so every year or so. So that is the most helpful things. So for the generator, it's just a technique we use. So if we don't use GAN, we can use other generator to generate images. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny in that, like, huh? you know, GANs are so popular and quote unquote sexy term. It's almost like a head fake that kind of pulls your attention away from what you're actually trying to do in this paper. Yeah, 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 actually it is. So, <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm not sure you've even talked much about the classification model. So for land use, it's a pretty basic, like a, a convolutional network. So like a, we use ResNet 101 to do that. Um, so actually, uh, we have a, like a previous work, like a, three years ago, um, so it's also doing land use classification with like a convolutional neural network. I think at that time, we're the first batch of work that used deep learning for this kind of work. We also received the best post award in the SAM6 spatial conference. Yeah, so basically, it's you, uh, at that time, it's also the similar problems. We're using social media, we use deep learning, we do the land use classification. But the biggest problem is we don't have the ground truth, right? If we don't have ground truth, we cannot evaluate our model. So at that time, we just took a, like a university campus to do the land use classification task. It's a trivial example. It's a toy example, but we get like a very good accuracy. So since that time, we start to build a very large data set. And uh, actually, we took like two years to build a data set and uh, continue this line of land use classification system. Yeah, but in, in this work, in this GAN paper, uh, we're just using a very standard ResNet 101 network to do the land use classification. Does the social media images come into play in this paper? Oh, yes. So for the ground level images from the geograph data set, so those are all like the ground level images. So social media, right? Those social media are contributed by just resident in the United Kingdom. So anybody can submit an image to the website and the website will show it. So where the photo is taken and uh, what it's about. So, so yeah, for that data set, it is totally like, like social multimedia. And remind me how, where that comes into play in the system? The system is uh, when you do the discriminator, right? You need to tell um, this image is fake or real, right? But uh, how do you de determine whether it's real or fake? You have to look at some ground level images to know it is real or fake, right? Oh, so right. that right. Yeah, that's what they come into play. So although the input is overhead imagery, but the ground truth, like something you compare to, is the ground level images. So that's when the social multimedia come into play. And those images are, they're not labeled at all with regard to land use or anything like that. It's just, that's the training, the discriminator to understand real versus fake images. 
Yes, yes. That's the beauty of GAN, right? So right, right. We, we don't care about the labeling. We don't need to know the land use classes. We just need to know this is a real image. That is a fake one. So. <laughs> okay, cool. I think... I think I've got it now. So the to sum it all up, right? You've got this this challenge of being able to develop accurate land use classifiers, but you've got this problem of sparse data, right? So you've got all of this area that you might want to classify based on satellite images, but that you don't have specific uh ground level data for. So you generate some realistic looking ground level data using the conditional GAN and then use that to train your classifier. And uh, you've been able to kind of incrementally improve the performance of the classifier using this kind of data as opposed to previous data sources uh, that are trying to approximate this data that you don't have. Yes, yes, correct. Yeah. Got it. Exactly. Got it. Uh Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I don't know why this one was so difficult for me to wrap my head around, Uh, but I think a part of it (laughs) had to do with this this GAN head fake. (laughs) Yes. So so most of the people just focus on the GAN. So, oh, what GAN can structure you're using? Are you using the state of art GAN? So, yeah. So actually, we're doing something like for geospatial analysis, so for the land use classification. So that's our mm-hmm. final aim. Awesome. Are there other interesting aspects of this paper that we haven't touched on yet? Yeah. So for this paper, there's uh, no, not. Uh, but for the future work, right? I want to talk about the future work a little bit. So that's very interesting. So the first thing about the future work is, so right now our generated ground level images like is not real enough. So they lack the image details. So so for some like houses or like animals, they don't they don't look real enough. Um. So there is like plenty of room for improvement. Uh. So currently we're thinking so we we want to use a, a technique called a progressive GAN. So from Nvidia. So, so that method is the key idea is to grow both the generator and discriminator progressively. So from a small network, from a small resolution, uh, we add new layers to the model and increasingly train the model uh, so in a progressive manner. So this can both speed up the training procedure and stabilize the model because scan is really hard to train. So sometimes it's just a model collapse. Um, so this could eventually lead us to a very like good uh, image resolution because currently our generated image is only like 32 by 32 or 64 by 64 so it's very coarse so but eventually we'll want to have some images like a 1k by 1k or 2k or even 2k so because most of like a remote sensing imagery is, is like a 2k by like 3k so it's very large and it's very detailed so we want our generated ground level images is also large and detailed so i think that will bring up our performance by a large margin okay so, yeah, so that's the first direction. And the second direction is, so there's also recent work by OpenAI called GLOW. So it, they're using reversible generative models. They're not using GANs, but reversible generative models. So that model, the most, the good thing about it is um, their latent space, so I mean the features. So the features are useful for downstream tasks because in GANs, so the data points can usually not be directly represented in a latent space. So because they have no encoder and they don't have all the data distribution. But for re- reversive generative models, they can like they can interpolate between this feature space. So it's very smooth. So in that case, we can directly use the features. We don't need to use images. So I, I hope that can be a better solution. And then I think like a lot of people are interested in this paper as well. So the, the glow one. So it can generate mm-hmm. very realistic images. And uh, the third direction will be using more information, uh, as you talk about. So maybe using like an information retrieval thing or using some like a text, text information, right? Because for, for example, so if we want to generate like a forest like image. So if we just give him the overhead imagery, so maybe he cannot like give us a good image. But if we can say, so I want a forest wheel with like a, with a, with one house inside it. So maybe in our generated ground lab images, we will see exactly one house in a forest like scenery. So that's very promising. So uh, that's the third directions to go. So, so this work, this GAN work is our initial attempt um, to do this dense, uh, dense interpolations uh, in this direction. So we have a lot of work coming up. 
Um, so hopefully we can get better results in the future. You mentioned with regard to the Glow paper, I've seen it, but I haven't looked at it in any uh, detail at all. You mentioned that part of what it allows you to do is to get these smooth representations in a feature space. Yes. And are you? would you then be trying to use that feature space, or is the only benefit to you of that that it produces better images? I think we will try both, so better images and the features. I think maybe the image, uh, maybe the features makes more sense because for glow work, they are reversible, right? So the reversible means if you have some input and go into the output, it it can also use output to get you the input. So the the reversible makes the features more robust. So it makes sense. It is explain ex, uh, like explainable. So in that case, the features might be more powerful than the game features. Are the features in this feature space, are they semantically related? Like, is it kind of an embedding in the feature space where you can get these semantic relationships between these different types of generated images? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, the features should be like semantic related. So if we do like a, like a feature space visualization, we can see so like, uh, like a tree forest are clustered together and the river, water, lake, those images are clustered together. So the features are definitely semantic related. And so do you think you'll get to a point where you can start with a ground truth image of a field and say like, I want a little bit more, you know, rivers and then get a stream and a little bit more rivers and get like a, a bigger body of water or something like that? Wow, you're really like smart. So that that's something we're we're trying to do right now. So okay, that's yeah, that's more like a manipulative of the image, right? So uh, yeah, if you if we can do that, so that's very interesting to the geospatial communities. Just to kind of wrap things up, I'm curious. You mentioned how difficult training the the GANs uh, has been. Can you? Maybe share with us some things that you've uh, you've learned as you've tried to to work with GANs and conditional GANs. Okay, sure. Uh, so for GANs, so because we're using a very standard conditional GAN, so which is proposed like 2015 or 16, so it's very earlier stage of the GAN. So the training is like uh, unstable, so have a lot of problems. So as mentioning another paper, um, I forgot the exact name, but it should be like a like good practices during like training, implementing GANs. So they propose like uh, we should use straight convolution, not pooling, because pooling can hurt the like image resolution thing during the downsampling. And uh, we should like using smaller crop size and a smaller learning rate, something like that. But, uh, be- but I don't think that's a, a major problem right now because most of um, GAN models is uh, like easier to train at this moment. So the because the loss matrix changes to the versus 10 loss, so that is a very stabilized loss function. Uh, and uh, also the network architecture change. So right now we can train very deep networks using GAN. So for example, like a ResNet 101, and the output can be like several hundred resolutions or even 1K resolutions. So the training of the GAN is not that hard right now. Awesome. Well, E, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us what you're working on. It's really interesting stuff. Yeah, no problem. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. For more information on E or any of the topics covered in this episode, head over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 172. As always, thanks so much for listening and catch you next time.